Might as well. But you guys both know who I am, correct? I'm Simon, the reference to library here. So, well, thank you for coming. And I, I guess the question for you right off the bat is, do you use Zotero already? Or? I've, I've used it before, okay. but not in a systematic way. Okay. And that's good to know. And I know based on, I believe I met you at that um, session with Elliot Reed, correct? Where, mm -hmm. yeah, so you're working with like long-term research projects with a lot of citations. Okay, so that's good to know. Because I think like the way I frame this is it's kind of like either you really like managing a lot of citations or you're really disorganized, but then this kind of becomes like a necessary evil in a way. Like you don't want to just have PDFs that are unnamed, floating around. Um, and I know I often tell students like, if I had known about this when I was an undergraduate, it would have made life so much easier, both from like being able to write within um, like the site while you write, in addition to just keeping track of everything. Yeah. Um, or you can also cover how to waste track of the citations. Yes, and that's what I was going to say. So, something that I haven't done so far using Zotero. Okay, and so that's actually, and, and that's a good point to raise, and that's basically, I mean, site while you write is kind of like one part of this presentation, but the big part is thinking about how to get access to the citation data. Um, and I'm going to show you three ways, um, one of which involves getting access to the PDFs and storing those PDFs. Um, I always make the analogy to iTunes, if you used it back in the day, like that's basically what this software becomes, um, which has its pluses and minuses. But yeah, um, this is what I surveyed you guys on. And uh, I think, you know, we're going to address all of these to varying degrees. And we're also going to address probably, there should be another one up here that says, um, just introducing what Zotero is specifically. But as you guys indicated, um, it might not show up too well, but these three in the middle are the ones that are, you know, you guys want to know the most about. Um, I don't know if the two of you didn't fall into that category, but if not, we can switch it. Um, accessing full text is kind of more universal. And then thinking about how it compares to other tools, I'm going to touch on that throughout. Um, at the end, I'll mention RefWorks, but RefWorks really isn't too relevant, although we might consider getting it as an institution because we could negotiate that um, through our statewide consortium buying. Um, but EndNote is really the only alternative. Um, there's also Mendeley, but I can also mention Mendeley, why it's good or bad. So I was just mentioning this, but I mean, just to check the boxes here, I mean, yeah, it's gonna do all these things. Uh, save references, um, I'll show you how to share them um how to upload them i mean storing pdfs is a great thing if you are i guess background i've definitely worked with a large research network that was spread across canada and they would use it all the time because the way zotero works and what i'll show is once you have an account you then can be invited to these groups that then exist on the online version and then you can sync up your account to have that basically downloaded to your desktop version so it becomes very powerful um, when you're trying to share, like, you know, I know there's people on campus, a researcher was emailing me the other day talking about a, you know, 500 or 1,000, whatever, collection within EndNote or another citation manager, and I know that there's probably a lot of researchers on this campus who have similar situations, and being able to share that with your colleagues, especially in a region like this one, um, where we have so many affiliations, is probably going to be a good thing. Um, and then, yeah, the site while you write and thinking about um, formatting the manuscript. Um, so just as a little bit more introduction on the tool. So Zotero is created out of a university, which I think is kind of a, a fun thing. Um, this center uh, has created a digital library platform too, but Zotero really is like their most widespread and it's been in operation since I think 2006. Um, so it's going on a decade and they're just updating their interface. Um, so it's a great example, I guess, of like what you would see coming out of the ready zone here. Um, and I was just reading, it's, it has some good philanthropy behind it, like you know, Carnegie Foundation. So um, these are the main strengths and weaknesses in my mind. Um, do you, are you guys familiar with what open source is? Something, if there is any promotions yeah, 
Yeah, and like um, basically, yeah, like it's it's freely available. The the source code is shared. Um, so if you've ever been on like GitHub, um, you could find a lot of information about Zotero versus a proprietary. I mean, there's um, like LibreOffice, if you're familiar, versus Microsoft Word. That would be an example. It's kind of exactly what we're talking about here, a proprietary version. Um, I think a good point to make out is um, the strength is it's very interoperable, kind of like uh, when you have an Excel file, you can open it in Google Drive. This operates the same way. It automatically updates to Microsoft Word with the plugin. You don't even have to download and install anything. And it also now integrates with Zoom, I mean, um, Google Drive. I mean, it integrates with Zoom too. It's interesting, I know all these weaknesses and I thought that Zoom might be because I don't know a way around this, but it's actually really yeah. the weakness. Yeah, like uh, time syncing, like taking a while. And the limited the storage that you after yeah. after searching, you yeah. actually need to purchase the storage. Yes, and I think that's a good point to make because I do have students and people ask, um, you know, how much is 300 megabytes? Um, I've, I did a, like just a, an example today. I went into an Elsevier hosted journal, pulled 20 articles, and that was about 20 megabytes. So that gives you a good. So my guess is that'd be between 300 and 400 full text PDFs. Yeah, it's really hard when you're trying to attach your papers to the links. Uh -huh. You're att attaching too many papers, so you're actually uploading your papers and the actual mm. to the links that you have available there. It's going to take all your storage, and then very soon you'll run out of space. That's yeah. what happened to me. And, yeah, and, and that's the, the question that I always had there, because I totally <laughs> understand like that would be very frustrating. Um, was this a case where you're trying to share like full text PDFs, or was it just a way to store them? Would that make sense? Okay. I, that might be something to take a look at. Yeah, because the point that I always make is that if you don't need to store the PDFs in Zotero, I mean, I know I have like 100,000 citations without the full text PDFs, mm -hmm. and that's with the free version. Because if you remove the PDFs and you just, as I'll show, you can double click on your citations and then it takes you to the full text. Um, and so that's, but then I know there's the other of what I just explained where you're trying to share, you know, 300 PDFs across the country. Um, all, I actually set up a little demo to show like based on importing the full text PDFs um, that I can boil down into. Um, I've already gone over a few of these. Um, so let's, move on here. Oh, the other thing that's more recent that I like about Zotero, um, I think, again, because it's not attached to any publisher. That's probably another strength. Um, Mendeley is attached to Elsevier. RefWorks is attached to ProQuest. And that can create these sort of systemic biases, in my opinion, like Elsevier. If you import non-Elsevier articles, historically, it's been very hard to get that metadata. Um, and recently, Zotero has started showing you when um, articles are redacted, um, which is not always readily seen on the journal publication pages in my experience. It'll show a red redacted mark at the bottom of your collection. It just automatically can pull that information. Um, so that's more on open source and I'll send these slides out later. Um, okay, so to set it up, and this is where it's like a preface for this institution. I don't know why this is the case. Um, in my particular case of a laptop, I was able to install Zotero, but I've met with other researchers with their computers here and the admin does not allow for it. So I don't know, if, but you're a student, correct? I'm a student, yeah. but I'm also a graduate student. So it's okay. a little bit different than medical students. I have it, but I actually just Oh, okay, and it's a it's an institution issued computer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good. And that's what I've experienced is some people have no problem. I tried installing it on this computer, and I did not have the credentials to be able to open it. But um, this might be something long term to talk to the institution about. But if not, and if you have a personal device, but also I imagine most work computers should be set up this way. All you have to do is go into this website here. This page will open. You click download and then installs the desktop client um, just straight away. Um, and then the next step before you start 
importing and uh, pulling your citations to create a free online account. So just like with EndNote or any other citation manager, um, having a, an account is kind of the centerpiece to making sure everything sort of talks to each other because there's the online version, um, the desktop version, and then there is the, um, the desktop version here. So once you've gone in, and maybe here I'll pop in to just show you, you would just go here and register for a free account if you don't have one already. Um, so if I go back to the slides now, so, so say you've downloaded the client, you've installed, you've opened the client, all these things that will take about 10 minutes. You set up an account, which is very straightforward. It's whatever credentials you want it to be. Um, then you would open the desktop client. It would look something like this. Um, none of these folders would be here uh, because this is my instance, uh, but it would look just like this. Um, so as you can see, it's a pretty basic interface and, it, and I mean, user-friendly, basic. I think that's a kind of similar thing. Um, in a sec, I'll switch over to my HDMI hooked up laptop here to sort of do a live demonstration, but for the sake of just getting through this part of the presentation, um, I'll stick to the slides. Um, once you are in, there's, you would hit edit, and then under edit, there's preferences, and then you would hit sync, and then you log into your account. And once you log into your account, then it syncs between the two. Um, the really important reason for allowing for syncing is that it allows you to create groups, those groups I was telling you about, where you can share it. And these groups can be completely publicly available, or they can be um, shared via a link to be um, only available to those who um, are granted access. And that, in that case, it's about full text PDFs. You can't, sure. oh, yeah. Sure I just thing. wanted to see, uh, oh, so you create different folders and you have different subfolders. Can you just share a particular subfolder with certain people? Yes, you definitely can. And, and as a point of reference, that's what I do with researchers across this campus and sometimes students. Um, so I get requests to do a search on a topic. Um, Usually if it's over like 20 references, I don't want to put that into a PDF and just send them a giant long string um, because sometimes I'll find a hundred results. And so what I'll do is I'll either subdivide that into multiple folders by date or by topic and then just share those links. Um, I do not do the full text version because then I have to start saying, oh, well, yeah. set up your account login. Um, but I do really, and I'll get into that in a bit and show you some examples, but it is a very straightforward and they are persistent links in my experience. Um, so say you've done all this, you sync it up, um, and now we'll think about importing references because I know that this is a topic that you guys both of you indicated you're interested in. So really when it comes to importing references, uh, there are three main ways to do it. Um, there's the good old fashioned way, which is exporting a file. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do this, um, one of which I'll go into specifically here. Uh, you can also download the PDFs and then drag and drop the PDFs into, that'll be option number two. And then option number three, what I think is the most convenient, although it takes a little bit more setup time, is to have um, the plugin configured within your desktop browser. And I'll show you screenshots now, and I'll keep just going through this content, and feel free, again, because it's just three of us, to interject with questions. Um, and then I'll do some live demonstrations. Okay, so say you were in um, PubMed here, and you did this search on a department or a, an affiliated institution, an emergency service, and you had these 50 results. Um, I know that the new PubMed interface is coming out, and I know that this looks, can be a little small. Can you guys see this okay? Okay, so say you had, you wanted all these 50 items. If not, you would check these certain boxes. Um, but say you want all 50, you would click on this send to here. And this is very similar if you're trying to export it to EndNote as well um, from PubMed. You would click file, you would select the Medline option, and don't worry about writing this down because I'll send this to you after. And it doesn't matter what it's sorted by. And you would click create file and it's just gonna create the file. It's automatically gonna download it for you. 
So there you have your file. It's a TXT file with 50 references. So to get that into Zotero, you would use the desktop version, which you have installed. Um, you would go into File, Import. This window will pop up. And then you would select that. This would be the download, the TXT file. And then they would automatically import just as these screenshots show. Um, so does that make sense? Great. So the other option, and this might be a good point to go into a live demo, because I know dragging and dropping. So does this make sense? That's pretty straightforward, right? Like just you have a batch of PDFs you've downloaded, you have your folder set up, you put it in, you drag and drop, it automatically just, at first it, sh it imports the PDFs. And in fact, I will go into a live demo really quick. Because I think that this is an important part that's kind of hard to show in slides. And I pulled some for convenience. Okay, so this is an example of a group. And I'm gonna get to this in a second, but for the time being, just this would be the same as if it was up here. I set up a folder demo for library workshop. I downloaded a full issue of Science Direct articles. You can see Science Direct if you can read that. Um, I don't know the name of the journal, but so looks like complementary therapies in clinical practice. So say you wanted that entire issue. And I'll just do this again for the sake of demonstration. You would just select all of them, <clears throat> drop them. Let's see how fast this does it. Um, so like you're saying, if, if the library doesn't have direct full text access. Um, so in that case, it probably would make more sense to just export the uh, meta, like the what I showed in that first option, the metadata, not to get too technical. Um, it'll just be the information. Let's go. Um, there we go. So once you import that, um, you would then have that saved for later, but you would have to request it through interlibrary loan. Um, it I hope, it kind of gets into the separate talk, topic about like being able to retrieve the full text. Um, but once you do have that saved, let me, sh let me just for, the sake of, so these, none of these, I rarely save full text. So here's an example where it's just saved the DOI. So I double click that and then it just opened it. And this is a case where we don't have full text, but that information is saved for later. Um, to get full text, are you comfortable with knowing where to go? Like how to request it? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Great. Does that answer? Yeah. Um, okay, so if we go back here, you'll see that it's it's importing all of them. Um, it also looks like it's automatically just processing it. So that's kind of convenient. Um, before it did not do this for me, but you see here we have the PDFs and you look here. So you see here, there's no meta, there's no information about it. So at first it's just the files. Um, that's not really convenient for sharing um, because in this case, it looks like the titles are pretty well contained within it, but really it's much more beneficial to have this information here. So that automatically got synced. I imported the PDFs and it just started syncing it automatically. So it extracts these information from the PDF. Yes. So you don't need to actually manually go into each section and think of what this is. Exactly. And that's, yeah, so that's the main, and, and that's why I went in here. I was surprised, I guess pleasantly surprised that it did it automatically. Um, before, all I had to do, um, I guess there is an asterisk to your question. I mean, if you're doing historical research and you're pulling PDFs that are scanned from 50 years ago, there's not gonna be that character recognition. But in a case like this, where it's, I think this is an addition from 2020, everything is optimized to just be quickly churned through. So what you would do 
is you click here. So you right click and then retrieve metadata. That's what it did automatically. If it didn't do that automatically, you just have to select all the PDFs, right click this puzzle, retrieve metadata. Um, while we're in here on, a, on the topic, um, for off-campus access, you were talking about full text. Um, there is a way to, this is later, but, and this would be something that you'd probably just wanna ask me about, but as you can see here, we have our proxy. Um, so you can go in here to advance and say, I wanna sync this up to this, our university proxy. So it'll ensure that you're getting access to full text when you double click. When you're on campus and you double click, you're probably gonna see right away because we're in the secure network here. But when you're off campus, there might be cases where you have immediate full text and it might not show up. So putting in this here, um, and, it, and I can send you this later if you want. Um, Actually, this is a very good tip. I never use this. Yes. It's, it's something that's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I agree with you. And um, it, yeah, it'd be your library login from off campus. And so. So you can actually yeah. save all these information here. In the yep. That's exactly it. And as you can see here, I don't know how all well this works. <laughs> but it's probably they just pull off the registry of the proxy that the library pays for. But if you see here, it says custom. So it says all of Rokasic Regional Medic, that's the former name of the library here. It's what's usually registered. So that one there is different. So this would be, I might need to look into this a little bit more. I put in a different proxy, but this might, think about doing these workshops for the first time. I'll look into that. In this slide deck, yes, it definitely. And if not, you would just have to go into PubMed, for example. Um, I know if you have a Mac, like I have a Mac, and like cookies remember the proxies if you've experienced that. Um, but at the end, I can give a brief overview of like if I were off campus and this wasn't working, what I would do to ensure that you would find the full text, which is you know search in PubMed or search in one other location. Okay. Any information is basically it's not in the computer, it's in the cloud. Yes. Even in the same computer, we need to log in to the Not not through the university network. Um, this one is specific to the university, but everything else is more specific to just um, your personal login. So you see here, um, <laughs> it's hard for me to do this because I've, I've changed my account to say Neomed Library, but it used to just say Simon Robbins. So this is just my personal account. I've called it Neomed Library because I share with researchers and I work for the library, but um, it's really hinging on this, less specific to you know, Neomed. So that's the, actually the cool thing too is, I mean, you know, once you graduate or, you know, you would still have all this information with you. It's not, it's not linked up to your time here. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's the drag and drop. And we also covered some stuff that I was going to cover later. So we're doing pretty good on time. Um, okay. So this is actually, and I'll probably switch back to my laptop. This is my favorite way of doing it um, because it is the most straightforward. Um, way possible. Um, the only thing is if you do want to save the full text PDFs, um, well, actually, I'll, I won't get ahead of myself. Um, that's where it becomes a little bit trickier, but you can search for full text um, from Zotero. But a, a convenient tool to get around that first option that I showed, where you have to go in, you have to save the file, then you have to open the file, is to install this plugin. Um, it works especially well with PubMed. It has some occasional hiccups when I've worked within Zotero databases, um, but I still use it. And when it works, it works really well. Um, I think just sometimes 
but with PubMed, it's, it never fails, man. And I really appreciate that. So this is a free thing to install. Sorry, before you go back, so do you need to be an Autoplex cable access or in Chrome to be installed? Oh, yeah, Chrome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, either. I know that it's, a, it's something connected to Firefox. I believe that it's one that I started using when I knew that it was particularly coming with Firefox and then probably started developing it to be used with other browsers as well. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And that sounds like in my time, it's always been worked fine with Google Chrome. Um, and so Tarot 2, it should work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I first time I started using it was 10 years ago. Okay. And I think at the time it was particularly linked to Firefox. Okay. And that's interesting to know. Yeah. So I mean, that's good. I know like about a year ago it started Interop. It had, it used to only work with Word, the writing site. And then all of a sudden it was available on Google Chrome too. And so like, there's like little, you know, it's definitely trying to broaden its reach. So it's good to know that it's been um, expanding. So yeah, I think whatever app store you go or um, plugin store you go into, um, this is something I don't necessarily have time to like go into. Are you guys both familiar on how to add plugins to your browser? Um, if not, I can show at the end. Is it something that can be in the slides for your account? Yeah, so I'll send these slides out after. This is the only one I put a screen capture of. Um, but here I can show quickly since Seems like both of you guys would benefit. Um, here, let's go in. So probably to begin, yeah, Zotero plugin. It, this is something that it's been, you know, years since I've done. Um, Zotero connectors. But I think just in general too, um, So get Zotero, show all connectors. So that's how you would do it. And then once you click on that, yeah, so that takes you there. For some reason, I thought you might also have to go in through like the Chrome store, but it turns out you don't. So um, basically, if you go to Zotero.org, did that, did that make sense or did I go too fast? Um, Okay, go back to the web. Okay, so once you install it, you will see, once this disappears, this little HDMI, um, you will always see this in some variation. Um, either it'll appear as a Z um, or it'll appear as like a more of like a document. That means that you could cite and save this website, um, if that makes sense. In, or go on. I, I just noticed where it's located. Uh, oh, great. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. Will it let you install it on that computer? Yeah, it or, did. It actually. did. I mean, okay. in my group, I've been pretty lucky with my own new management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm all for it, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I guess you can, you can test this out. But basically, in this case, we're on that result list of 50, so it shows up with a folder because it's not an individual document, it's a multiple result set. So it creates this opportunity to basically save it as a folder. Um, for this to work, you do have to have the Zotero desktop client open. Um, so if not, it'll just show up and then it will show up with an error and say, we don't know where Zotero is because it's saving it to the desktop. Um, but Assuming you have those things in place, what pops up is this little pop-up window. So these are the 20 results that are on this page um, that you can then, if you check the boxes before you click on this green little or yellow little folder, um, they'll already be checked. If not, you just either say select all or you go through and you click the ones you want. And then when you click OK, sometimes this goes quickly. Um, so rather than depending on, you, you see this little thing will pop up. And I'll show you, a, I can show you a live demo just to like drive it home. Um, 
it'll show up and it'll let you choose the folder to put it in. Um, that's one way of doing it. My preference is just within the, if you're in the Zotero desktop client, just go to the folder you want to be in and then the, the plugin will automatically know to put it into that folder. So it really communicates with it. So then it just goes, this is the example, those are the citations. And so maybe I'll switch over here just to show an example. So say, we can even use the new PubMed. Okay, does anyone have a sample topic? Or, yeah. Amygdala and Hotel Yeah, okay. I'll do it. Yeah. Okay, so say, we'll just say you want these initial 20. Uh, so this is the thing I was talking about. So this is where I'm gonna say, I'll put this into, I'm gonna show this in a sec, but this is just to think about like creating folders. So amygdala, and I spelt all this correctly, didn't I? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. amygdala um, sample. It's a sound strange. Um, okay, so you're in that folder, and this is where hopefully it works. So I'm gonna say I want all of these, and then I'm gonna click okay. So there it goes, into the demo for workshop, and then I think it's saved up to this folder. So there you see them popping up. Um, we can look right here if we do date added. <clears throat> if you guys are with me, so it was 12, 36. So it looks like we had 10 showing up on that page. Yeah, we have 10. The new PubMed doesn't show 20, it shows 10. But you see that? So here's the 10 results that just imported. Um, and I just sorted by date to make sure. So there's the amygdala. So just right away, it just saves them for you. And if you wanted to, I know sometimes, I, if we have time, I can show like an EBSCO database. Um, yeah, it'll, you can have a lot more because it depends how the, the database basically works, if that makes sense. Um, do so, this, so this stuff you have open here is the app or is the, uh, plugin. Does uh, it matter which one you have open when you're trying to link things? Um, so the plugin is the only one I have experience with. There's an app or do you saw? The app, but then um, do, if you um, have, if you just enter through the Tarot website uh -huh. and have your folders open, that's not uh, going to do it. Because I, I think, right now I can't get it to yes. go to I see what you're saying. So that is a very good question. And the answer is that you can only save them to your desktop client. And that's the reason to have. So um, I'm sync it later. yes, and I'm going to, I'm going to show that um, in a few, but basically like you're talking about this situation. Yeah, yeah. See, that's what I have yeah. open right now. And it doesn't upload it to this around. Yes. And that is the, that's probably the main difference between how EndNote works and this works. Um, is that you don't save things to your online account so much as you save them to your desktop. Um, the online account is for sharing the results with others and just, I guess if you're not with the computer they haven't installed on, you could log in and access it. Um, like here, this is the, so there's, there's the groups we just created and it, it syncs automatically. So this is what I was talking to about at the beginning with the logging in, um, so you see it syncs. Uh, we're kind of bouncing around, but um, yeah, so you have to have this, this desktop version open for that to work in that same way. Um, as a good, let's see, if we double click on these, it's gonna take us, in this case, it looks like it's an open access article, so it just automatically open the PDF, which is, Cool. I think that might be a new feature with the new PubMed. Um, let's try another one. Again, it's just opening the full text. So that's actually, I don't know, they just switch it as quickly as they can to make it better. So that's better than the old PubMed. So it looks like this would be a good example. Uh, so I'm just gonna do something really quick just for the sake of curiosity. If we go, 
It's switched to my other. Okay. So this kind of, we'll get to the question about the proxies. Um, I'm just going to see if this is an open access journal. Um, so this is not. So that would be an example of the like the proxy that I've put in working. Does that make sense? Because if you're if we were on campus, this would not, right? We see the Neomed Library logo. This is not an open access article. So you need to be logged in to get it. So you're, if you're off campus, I guess there's no way for me to test it right now. I guess I will. But if you would double click just like I did, it would probably take you to this screen and either present the proxy login or just say you have to pay for it. Um, I'll do some testing. And these are all things to keep in mind. But I guess the, the, the takeaway point from what I just showed is that it seems like it's working better than I thought it does. And it now just automatically opens the PDFs. Um, and I think the, the point is, is those are not cases where we downloaded the PDFs. Um, I know you mentioned a question about, or I mentioned the idea of um, locating. <clears throat> yeah, this is Yes. Yes, you definitely can. Um, you might. I don't. I should have written this down, but I haven't used it in a while, so I don't have the login. But I could show you on yours if you're able to log in right now, but or just like after the session. But yeah, you can export. Um, EndNote in that same format we had exported from PubMed. So you could export your entire library or whatever you want to do. Um, save that in a file and then just import it to Zotero. Um, it's kind of that analogy I was talking about before. If you have an Excel file, you can open it in um, a Google Drive format. Um, it just automatically converts it. Um, so I know like that research network I worked at, they had previously had it in one format, we moved it to EndNote, and then we moved it to Zotero. So um, it's just, it, it might take you like an hour or so to do. Uh, so. Um, and same would be for the library, you see that you can find it. Sorry, what? Library then, let's say I have a thousand papers, you know, selected in my library. Uh-huh. So how can I export this from Excel? So that would be Yeah. That would be a good I wanna say you could just export them, but I don't maybe they don't allow for quick exporting of like downloading PDFs. You only have them saved in EndNote, you don't have them saved in in the EndNote and I don't think it's that it's just you know title. Oh okay. So if I want, because it's quick, like view when I need to export those. Yeah. Area like I have 2050 or 100, you know, paper already selected. If I need to read, I can open similar like this. Yeah. If you click on this, I can export some page. Yeah. This is the upside. Yes, and or just the 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 ones that we have immediately available in our holdings. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so it, 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 based on my understanding, you don't have a bunch of full text in EndNote. You have no. the citation. So in that case, it would be very easy to do. Um, and then if you want to get a hold of the full text, um, this is what I was going to show. I think that um, I might have, I'm going to go into this group, which does not have, OK, so here's ones that don't have PDFs. This is where you can start to say, and this is something I don't do often, but you, I can show it again. I can see what I'm looking at. Um, so I did not find a PDF. This would be something that I could get back to you guys about. Um, would this be something you'd be interested in knowing, like thinking about if you just exported all the citations? Um, this would be, I won't go into it now, but I think, the thing that needs testing is that syncing up of that proxy. 
like what we were noticing before. And then I think in theory, um, this is also what people pay the you know money to EndNote for. So you can, like I, I remember my previous institution, we would share EndNote files and it's kind of a double-edged sword because say if you wanted to send a list of these citations or like a, fi a file with these citations in EndNote and you download all the full text PDFs, that makes it a really large file and then it becomes cumbersome to send. And so we would always be on the fence about whether or not to start pulling all the PDFs. Um, but for the sake of your own library, like say you wanted, um, let me do it in batch. I can't. Um, but basically there is that feature. I can do research and get back to you guys on, on whether on how to make that work properly. Um, it does look like, interestingly, in this folder here, when we just imported them um, to this demo, they automatically, um, these amygdala articles just automatically pulled the full text, um, which is very cool. Um, I think it's a new feature, <laughs> but uh, I guess that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so for the sake of time, I'll get go and switch gears and talk about groups now and thinking about sharing. Uh, and so here, so organizing references, I think is kind of self-explanatory unless like, like I was saying, like, I mean, if you've ever used iTunes back in the day or any sort of folder structure, um, I'm, I'm guessing nobody here is into records management, but um, there can be chaos and there can be, um, you know, straightforward, very systematic. Um, and I think usually what enforces it for me is when I have to start sharing the folders that causes me to be very organized versus like what you see here, which is just, you know, PubMed result 10, result 40. Um, oh, before I go to groups, the other convenient thing, what I like is I like searching in multiple databases to make sure my bases are covered. Um, rather than having to worry about duplicates at the time, uh, are you already familiar with this? Like, no. Uh, okay, uh, great. Um, it, it automatically finds the duplicates um, and then you can merge them. So um, let me, it's always easier to go live. So here's, oh no, there will be an example. So here's an example of some duplicates, just like what we've been updating. So you click here, you see the two, they're identical. Sometimes you'll find three and there will be slight variations and you can choose which one. You just click merge. I'll click merge. Click merge. Very cool. I never saw it. Yeah. yeah, it's like there's all these, and then there's uncloud items. I know sometimes it's like there's so much to see. And while we're here too, right, here's the retracted items. So you see that, um, the red. So there's an example. So how do you get rid of the um, extra ones? Because I by clicking on them and clicking the item, it highlights both. Uh, yeah, do you mind if let me just look? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So once you click uh, merge two, it'll just turn them into one. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank you. That's so you were able to download Zotero here on this computer. Yeah. Huh. I just logged into my account. Yeah. That's interesting. So you have a different account than. Yeah. Did yeah. you get a chance though? Yeah, that might be it, because I've only been here for a year. Um, but definitely, I'll, the plan is to get IT to make it so anybody can download this. Um, okay, so we have about 11 minutes left. Um, Are you going to talk about how to um, extract the citations into it. Yeah, that's, uh, I know I talk a lot, so that's, uh, okay. I mean, these were very useful, yeah. at least to many listeners. Great. Um, okay, so real quick, I'll just do a demo to show you how that, like, syncing happened between the online and the desktop. So rather than go through the slides, like, if you go to desktop, or no, if you go to, oh, turns out I wasn't even on the slides. Okay, so, 
going back to here. So up here is my library, right? It's the thing that's not going to be visible online, except for, or it's something you can't share. In order to create these shareable groups, which are the ones all down here, so you see I have a lot of groups, and these are what synced. You just go into here, you would click new group, um, a test, and this is where, so if you want to share PDFs, you would create private membership. I usually just do public, but then you can't share um, full text PDFs, and then you click create group, and mm -hmm. then, oh, okay, uh, that's interesting. Let's try that again. I've never seen that. Test group. Let's do a number so there's no. Okay, there we go. So this is, means it's been saved. I mean, you don't have to click save again, but you can change the settings. Um, because I have, I mean, I could, it'll eventually show up here. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through syncing it um, because I have a lot in my library and these little notices will pop up. But basically, once you hit this green arrow, it then syncs and then it shows up here. Like 10 minutes before the session, I created this demo for workshop folder. And then as I showed before, we put in those amygdala ones. And now those results show up uh, here. So right, these were not in the folder until I put them in like 10 minutes ago. And then it automatically just syncs. Um, here's an example of like, so this is a private group. So I can't just send this link to anybody. They have to be invited and added because the full text PDF is included, but it's a great way to share. Um, it creates a, a great way to, if you're working with distant researchers. Um, so then you would just click here and you'd have the full text. So, I mean, this is the case where you're gonna end up, if you start dealing with 300 articles, you're probably gonna use up your space. I looked before, it's about, I think, $20 a year. So it is cheaper than EndNote. And like the full disclosure, because I probably won't have time to go into the comparisons, is, you know, we don't, our institution can't afford to pay for a site license for RefWorks or a site license for a desktop version of EndNote. So this is the one case where we can do it for free. Um, I think in time, there could be more pressure to get a better site license. Um, that would allow for greater storage, but those decisions are beyond my um, capacity. So, what about the storage option? If they take the hundred megabytes, is not enough to launch the process. Yeah, for sure. So, the price longer. yes, I can show you right now. Like, we can just look at this. Um, so, say you're logged in, uh, upgrade storage right here. So I could pay, so here's an example. So I've used 40% with some PDFs and a lot of citation data. Um, so if you wanted to do two, two gigabytes, which would be a lot, um, if you're able to put that in perspective, I think that'd be at least like 2000 plus articles. Um, that would be $20 a year. So that's way cheaper than EndNote. Um, yeah, I think EndNote is very appealing when your institution has it and RefWorks is too. Um, in this case, since I've arrived here, I've definitely steered people towards Zotero because if you're just dealing with the online version of EndNote, it's not as powerful as having this desktop version. Um, so, okay, so real quick with the time we have remaining i'm going to show the the slides for the site and write and i can quickly go into my word document too we just went through all this um these are examples that you can look at later like this is the research network that i was talking about um they have libraries and as i was saying before like when i do literature searches for researchers on campus i send them links to the public facing zotero libraries because it's just a really easy way to keep things organized um so if we move on now to, we've already done that, plugin. Um, okay, cite while you write. 
So once you download and install, um, in fact, on your computer now, if you're open Word, it should already show up. You just have to close Word after you install Zotero and reopen Word, and then this tab will show up. So this was actually a screen capture of um, when I was at a previous institution, which had EndNote. Um, I used Zotero. So Zotero automatically installs in Word, which I like because you don't have to do extra work. It automatically installs within Google Drive, um, Google Docs. And then you're able to, so this is, you click add edit citation into your manuscript. This pops up. Um, the options for citation style, in this case I've chosen Vancouver. There's also AMA. Um, and then you would click OK. And then you would search. So this little box pops up and you search for the citations you want to put in. Um, in this case, it's the emergency medicine example I was showing before. These are the articles in my folder, my Zotero um, desktop client. I click on whichever one. And then you just hit enter. And then it puts up the citation. And so at first it won't show this part. Back to that. Okay. It won't show this, right? So this appears when you click add edit bibliography. And this is actually something I learned recently. I think it's, um, don't click that until the, the very end. Um, I mean, if you do, it'll automatically update to a degree. Um, I used to think that it was better at, um, say, if you moved number two above number one in the paper. These, I was working with a student and it didn't quite sync up as I thought it would. Um, undoubtedly, this is a tremendous automation service, um, but I can't say undeniably that you aren't going to have to rearrange things in your citation list. Um, let's actually, does that make sense? Um, the other option is to go in here, right click on a group. And I do this because I share lists. So if you know a researcher and you want to send them a quick PDF, so what I do with a lot of researchers on campus, I go over a folder, I say click create bibliography folder. Um, I select, in this case, a window pops open and you copy it as a clipboard and then you paste it in a Word document and it's this beautifully formatted citation list. Um, you can also do this from the online version. You can extract citations. Um, but really, for the manuscript purpose, and this is where I'll switch back over, HDMI. Um, in the time remaining, unless you guys have other questions, based on any of this, okay. I'm really interested. Okay. I will. I can even send the video, and I also send a post survey um, in case yeah. you guys want to review. Um, I know with the previous workshop, it's getting things off the ground has been tricky, um, but I now have a survey, and I'll send the video I'll, uh, in the next couple of days and the slide deck. Okay. Well, no worries, but thank you for coming. Um, and for you, I can show you this. Let me say, Migdala, add edit citation. I'll just do APA for the sake of time. So mine takes a while because I have so many citations. It takes a while to cycle through. Um, I'm kind of wondering now if APA does number one, number two. It doesn't work because I'm considered a plugin or the connect connector into the board. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know, maybe it needs me, maybe it requires logging into my email account. Mm. Yeah. And, and you just opened it too? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a good reason not to have a couple hundred. <laughs> thousand but um it starts building so okay so it finally appeared so then you'd see here um and then you just click enter and then add edit bibliography um so i should have planned this better but my question was about when you have the citations that are numbered and they're like 
you know, footnoted, like I showed before with Vancouver. I used to think that when you rearrange them, like in the paper, that it would automatically rearrange, if that makes sense. Um, it does, it didn't the other week when I was working with a student. And so, because I've been busy, I haven't got around to testing it, and I thought I would just test it now. And I guess we- Nice, we're just taking care of it. Yeah, it's, and I wonder, so that's where, I think maybe, Okay, so this might be, that might be what we didn't do. So my guess would be, and I don't necessarily have time because I don't wanna go over, but um, my guess would be if you do start to rearrange stuff is to re-click this add edit bibliography or hit the refresh. And I'm hoping that it would. Um, I mean, I can't that. Yeah. I mean, this would be very useful for me because I'm writing me in the process of writing my dissertation. And it's gonna use up lots yeah. of work that I used to do manually. Yes. Um, but it's gonna take me some time to test it out and see whether it would automatically rearrange things. Yeah, and that's like the that I think those are all great points and then yeah. and and yeah, that it, it is a big what if, like if if it does do that. Yeah. Um are you at the beginning stages of writing? I mean, yeah, yeah. for the writing. I used to do all keys manually. You might laugh at yeah. me, but I used to go to Zotero and for every option I would check whether this is a journal article or something mm. else, and it would import all these information into different boxes, yeah. fill in, and then I thought that that's how it works. I mean, mm -hmm. I never checked to see whether automatically I can import things in it. So. Yeah, and that's like, and that's my totally my story too. Like before, um, you know, going to library school, but. Yeah. Um, Definitely, yeah, when I was an undergraduate, yeah, I, or even like early in grad school, it would be. Yeah. Sometimes it, it's just such a time suck. Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, it's hard to figure things out as you were working through so many things at the same time. Yes. There's not enough time to figure everything out. So um, this, honestly, was even more useful than the previous worship that I did. So great. Thank you so much, yes. Yeah, well. I think it's useful that you're asking where we are. Okay. That's why you were kind of aiming most of the presentation towards what most people are not familiar with. Yeah, I agree. And that's what was nice. I mean, definitely I would have preferred if um, all the people who signed up came, but I mean. Oh, it, did they, did you have more sign -ups? Uh I think there were three others, but it's, it's totally fine too, because if one of you had come to my office and said, I want to have an hour long, like, instructional session on how to use up terror, I would do that. I mean, maybe I'd schedule it, but um, yeah, I think this sort of like seminar format works well. Um, and it is sort of the nice thing versus a group of 19. It's yeah. hard to. Um, yeah, you can have it more, more specifically targeted to the people that are attending rather yeah. than having it more generalized. Yes. This was very useful. Thank Great. You. Well, yeah. and. Um, I know the next one of these, I mean, probably it wouldn't be useful to you, but um, yeah, we'll keep offering these same workshops. Uh, what is the next one? So the next one is just navigating library resources for your instruction and research, but it is, I shouldn't say but, um, or it, it, that it's only. It's, uh, it's not as specific as the PubMed one, but it's still gonna use those same ideas and it's gonna address thinking about EBSCO databases. Like today we only showed I only have time to show how this syncs up with Zotero within PubMed. Um, but thinking about all the resources that are available and then also the cases where we've recently, I'd say in the past year, really streamlined um, our operations to make it easier to search across all databases. Um, so we do now have better search features than we did before. Um, so there's like, there's the PubMed, that's 30 million. There's another database now that it's called like a, a federated search. Um, so it searches across multiple databases. So it searches across CINAHL, um, PubMed, Medline, um, like ERIC, everything that you could possibly, you know, we have a broad range of databases at our disposal, but we realized that like if you're doing a dissertation, I would suggest going into some of those specific databases. But if you're also doing a broad search to start out your dissertation, you probably don't want to go to 20 different databases to start your search. And you also don't necessarily just want to, you know, um, 
keyword search through Google. So it's gonna be thinking about how to tie that together while also thinking about tools like this. Um, so it's kind of the, the 30,000 foot view. I might just fill up Sam's. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. I found very helpful. Okay, well that's great to know. Like I really appreciate it. And yeah, yeah that was kind of the, the gamble with this. I mean, apart from knowing that a lot of other medical libraries and medical universities offer similar workshops. And yeah. so it's kind of like we should be offering these here. Yeah. Um, is just to, it was kind of to see whether or not there are, which there seems to be students such as yourself who are in high need of these sort of yeah. like long-term research projects. Yeah, um, I mean, for um, PhD students, it's very different than medical students. You know, we, yes. like I said, I've been here for so many years now. Mm -hmm. And my needs are very different than the students that simply take classes and leave after two years and they yes. don't do any research. Yes. So, it is, and it's it's um, it's been interesting to think about the because I've I've been at other medical universities where it's you know a lot of like postdocs or um, yeah. residents who would be supporting like we're helping out with the research yeah. and our students students still do that but then they're at those other institutions yeah. Um, so yeah there's there's students who need to find the articles within PubMed yeah. but then they want more of a crash course than probably you would yeah. which is the deep dive so. Yeah. Um, Yes. I, I'm glad that finally libraries decided something like that. It's really critical. I think it is useful for every researcher. I agree. And that's <laughs> that's my mission. Is to, yes. Because I know it is it's a <laughs> it's an interesting like premise to think about, you know, what if our researchers don't notice X, Y, and Z resources right. and right. how that would affect the final product, which then is huge ramifications for decades to come. So yeah. So, well, thanks again um, for coming, and you know, I've got, we have to sit here with this.